so I thought I'd just start. We've had obviously a lot of fascinating talks from lots of people from lots of different careers, so we didn't get a chance to ask any questions. So this is mainly going to be a chance for the audience to ask questions to our panel members, um, and then we'll also have the opportunity to discuss further. Um, so does anyone have a question to start us off? No, I've sort of uh, put you on the spot. Yeah? Okay, yeah. Um, I've got a question for uh, Tom, actually, uh, and talking about uh, your PhD. And you sort of maybe kind of like a lot of the struggles that you face kind of going through kind of like workload, I guess, and kind of like on with it a bit. Um, would, do you think it was a good idea to go straight into a PhD from a master's, or do you think it's <laughs> Sorry, just for the recording, I'm going to repeat it to the mic microphone. But it's just a question about transitioning from a master's straight to a PhD. So it be good. Thank you. Um, I, oh gosh, there's, there's probably a lot of people that's kind of give an opinion on this as well. It's it's the difficulty is timing, right? So you know you've got not much time to concentrate on finishing what you're doing and making a good effort for your masters simultaneously trying to work really hard to develop something you're thinking about that you want to do for the next four years. Um, I was quite fortunate, I had a studentship so the money was there um, and we were able to really quickly develop um, a project that, that fitted what I was interested in, what my supervisor wanted to do but um, I, d I, I wouldn't ever say, I God's sake, like, just get on with it and do it straight away. Um, there's benefits to doing that I guess, that you still academically fully switched on thinking in that way but uh, I'm sure there's a huge amount of benefits of just having a little bit of time um, just to determine what you really want to do because you've got to live it for a few years at least and go through the ups and downs so yeah uh, it's not really a very great answer but I, I don't know if anyone else has got any reflections to add to that no, everyone's too scarred like even not to these years <laughs> Okay, thanks for that. Um, anyone else have another question? We also have Nalani on the line, so a very rare opportunity to ask her and Diana a question about all of our amazing work. Can I ask her what species of parakeet that was? Nalani, did you hear that? <laughs> what, what species of parakeet did you mention in your talk? Tony Jean wants to know. What, what species of parakeet did you talk about in your talk? Ooh, I, I can't remember. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was in the genus Aratinga. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, I think we have a few more questions from the audience. So, did someone do to put their hand up? Yeah. Question for Tony. Um, this might be slightly simplistic, but um, the, one of the things that you said uh, should be a focus of the teacher is trying to get conservation or innovation or recovery, or whatever you want to put it, into. Yeah. What is one thing that you think could help that? Um, Sorry, I'm Yeah. So, so what one thing can we do in the economic sphere um, to drive nature up the agenda? Um, I think having some measure of the health of natural capital blended into national accounts. So at the moment we measure growth in GDP. This is our principal indicator of success. We've got a few other um, measures like inflation and the public sector deficit which are shaping decisions and all of these things presently have no relationship to the declining state of the natural world but if you take the view that healthy soils, pollinating insects, stable climate, uh, you know, access to food, all of those things that rely on a healthy ecosystem, they're declining and in the end they will feed back into the economy and, and cause serious um, negative consequences and so if we can start to blend that in to some way in which we're measuring the economy in, in a more rounded way I think that would make a huge difference because actually well, Robert Costanza let me just share one little statistic which sticks in my mind famous 2014 paper on the value of nature to the global economy Costanza estimated that ecosystem services are contributing value in the order of 125 trillion dollars per year 
global GDP is $75 trillion per year. And so we're degrading the natural assets that provide a bigger contribution than GDP, but we're not measuring it. And you know, that is an epic failure uh, of how we look at the economic system. And so closing that gap so that we can understand that actually we're not growing, we're contracting, because we're depleting the underpinning supporting structure of the entire economy. So fixing that, it seems to me, is quite fundamental. Um, you know, some people get a little bit nervous about this. You know, if we're going to put nature into the economic calculation, are we going to finish up commodifying it or privatising the natural world? I think the bigger danger is seeing that nature has no value. That's the bigger danger, in my opinion. So, so government is a big thing. Um, I don't know how many members of the government there are, like 120 MPs under minister, you know, the junior ministers, ministers of state, um, you know, members of the cabinet, something like that, isn't it? Yeah. And so you can imagine there's a, there's a huge spectrum of, of views in there. Um, but if you look at what has been happening over the last few years, uh, including the natural uh, environment, what do they call it, 25-year plan uh, on, the, on the environment, um, the Environment Act we just had, uh, the net zero commitments, um, various uh, new tools coming through on biodiversity net gain, on the um, you know nature recovery agenda, which is currently a green paper. It's actually been quite an active period of improving policy, and you know targets being set and everything else. And so, if you look at it from the point of view of what's actually happening, alongside you know the commitments being made, which have been coming from the prime minister, which is quite unusual, then you would say actually that this is a period where the environment. And, and nature has actually been um, something which, which is in the ascendancy. Uh, so, you know, I, I think that's what I would say, and I, I've been an observer of these things for quite a long time, and would say that the moment we're in is actually quite a dynamic one with quite a lot of commitment behind it. Um, whether that's the entire government is a different matter, but I think you can see that there has been, you know, quite a lot of progress, and I think part of it is down to this narrative shift. I think there has been an understanding that if you don't fix climate change and don't start to repair the natural environment, it's going to have social and economic consequences. I think that piece has begun to bite. Um, you know, everyone takes their political view, you know. I mean, have a look at the other parties. I mean, you know, what are you seeing coming from Labour or the Lib Dems at the moment? Um, open question. Do you see more leadership there? Um, or, you know, is there potentially a rollback of some of these policies on the farming side, for example? You know, we're the first country in the world to shift farming subsidies from area payments and into nature recovery. We've been I've been talking about that for 30 years, and it's actually happening now. Might it be the case that other parties would want to go the other direction? I don't know the answer to that. Um, but you know, I just encourage everyone to keep an open mind about, about the political and policy space, because surprising, surprising things can happen. Uh, nothing more surprising than my appointment. <laughs> Thank you. And just a reminder that any, speak, do, would you, any speakers, feel free to jump in if you, if you have an extra um, well, since you heard this afternoon how entwined Tony's career, my career, have been, I think it's important to <laughs> offer an alternative view here. Um, uh, really important to do that. He's also sort of partly in government, so he's got to say what he just said. Um, but uh, I, where I would agree with Tony is I think there's been some really good thinking from government over the last few years on this. And yes, some of the thinking around public money for public goods and a transition for agriculture so that where public money subsidies are being used. Uh, now, rather than to pay farmers just to produce food, but to deliver public goods like nature recovery, that's good. Good thinking behind the 25-year environment plan, good thinking behind lots of things. 
Uh, where I see we're not seeing a delivery at the moment is in the implementation. You know, there's, uh, it's very easy for governments to come out with the thinking, uh, but we're not seeing the sleeve being rolled up and delivering on the ground at the moment in the way that I think we should, and that's a real problem. You know, we've got these clear targets to put nature in recovery by 2030 in this country and rebuild our natural infrastructure. If we were hosting the Olympics in 2030, we would have a very clear project plan with GAN charts about how we're going to deliver this infrastructure. And if we miss some of the milestones along the way, uh, government would ramp up and take whatever steps are necessary to rebuild that, to build that infrastructure in time for the Olympics in 2030. We need exactly the same approach with uh, rebuilding our natural infrastructure in this country. We don't have that at the moment. We really have a bit of a crisis in seeing the kind of implementation of the ground that's needed. Also, we have the problem, as Tony said, yes, government's a big thing with lots of ministers, but we saw lots of policies coming out from government that are entirely incompatible with the good policies. So we might have all the good things that Tony was mentioning, but we also have government saying they want to get even more oil and gas out of the North Sea. We have, as you rightly say, complete failure by successive governments to do anything sensible or useful around energy efficiency, and the recent government's, uh, the government's recent statement around energy was completely topsy-turvy, back to front, you know, putting nuclear first and energy efficiency barely got a word. Uh, so that's no good. And then, don't even get me started on trade, you know, trying to rush around the world trying to get secure trade deals which will lower and essentially undermine uh, higher standards by UK farmers here. Um, so there you go, I just thought like, it's my job to counter <laughs> off you. His Majesty's opposition. And you saw I was nodding. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not supposed to. I'm not supposed to. Jack, at that. Thank you very much uh, for your wonderful talk. Um, my question is um, a few of you mentioned conservation happening in global regions by and large. Great. I was curious about what unique conservation challenges uh, that brings up and how you deal with it. Um, so I think the question is related to conservation in times of conflict. So. Uh, yeah, but it, it starts with war and conservation is not good. You start with that. Um, and, and actually, um, the thing that I've been experiencing trying to support our partner in Ukraine, um, half of whose staff have left, some have had to take up arms, is just the incredible solidarity amongst others. So within the horrors that are being inflicted by Russia on the Ukrainian people, I'm seeing our small community of nature conservationists in the border countries taking in refugees, completely readjusting their strategies, and thinking about how they're going to drop everything to help these people. So on the one hand, there's this incredible human to human solidarity, which is just extraordinary. But the horror of what's happening to the people is of course matched by the horrors of what's happening to the environment. And we've been trying with our partners to try and document that and talk to Dr. Grant, you know, FFI has convened the big NGOs to talk about this. And to, and to try and document what's happening and to try and make sure that the day when the hopeful reconstruction comes, that nature is part of that reconstruction. So I'm seeing solidarity amongst the birdlife family, I'm seeing solidarity amongst the international conservation community, and hopefully we can have that with the development community as well. So um, out of the horror, hopefully something good will come. Uh, and sadly, there are 19 wars going on in this world at any moment you know, now. Uh, and so I'm talking about Ukraine, we've had the same experiences in, in Syria, uh, and of course elsewhere in, in Africa. So um, we learn as we go, if the solidarity is there, I think we can do good. Yeah, just to add, I think, um, so we don't work in Ukraine, and I'll get to Myanmar in a moment, but just on the, on the Ukraine situation, we do have terrestrial focused projects in Kazakhstan and some of the neighbouring countries, and there's, there's obviously the, the, the horror in Ukraine, but then there's all the additional impacts of the refugee movement and migration on the, on the neighbouring countries, so we, we can't give up, we need to keep finding a way to make things work in the best way for conservation and, and the people that are being impacted. I think from the Myanmar side, um, so yeah, FFI doesn't shy away from engaging in those kind of places. Obviously Myanmar's not 
been that democratic for all that long, and then this recent change has not been helpful. Um, but we have been able to keep working. Um, we've kind of changed the way we work, so we're not engaging with the government, we're not showing support to the government. But our staff still want to work, they want a job, they're passionate about what they're trying to do, so we can't just pull out and say, right, that's it, we can't work with this government. We find a way to navigate that situation. So we're still able to engage with the communities and help set up locally managed marine areas that don't involve government designation and government support. So creating alternative ways to achieve conservation progress on the ground. Yeah, 100% agree with you on that, that we need to draw in everyone because it, it, you know, it's part of everyone's lives. It's going to impact everyone when things go wrong with the climate, when things go wrong with biodiversity. Um, so th the question is, are we doing enough? Probably not. I think there's a lot more we can do. But I wanted to sort of share that we are starting to do things, at least in my organisation. We have, um, for example, with our environmental education, we've taken a different trend of just saying, come on your biology field trip. We're now going to the schools and saying, let me teach you how to teach all of your subjects in the, using the school grounds and using nature. So how can you teach maths using nature? How can you teach English and art using nature? We're using our nature reserves for different things. We have a group from the NHS who come along and do wellbeing days. We have um, forest bathing and yoga in the woods. <laughs> and all kinds of other artistic courses like botanical drawing. So trying to draw in people who aren't conventionally necessarily involved in the natural conversation, but then can be part of it through their other interests, their other hobbies, and what else is important to them. So um, yeah, I think there's other points to be made about drawing in people who are economically inclined, but um, as for people who are maybe more artistically inclined, there are things happening, but hopefully it'll become more normal and more widespread. So just one, one little, just, just one, one small note of caution on this, and just reflecting back about 10 years, a bit longer even, and the extent to which some of the climate scientists who were coming out and doing public communications became the target of very vicious counter-attacks and the climate change deniers, and became accused of being unscientific on the grounds that they were taking political positions. So this is not to say that scientists mustn't go out and, cam well, campaigning is maybe the word which um, needs differentiating from awareness raising and communications. Um, because in that space, there is some peril, not always, but on the climate piece, it got really nasty a few years ago. And some of the scientists who had raised their voices, um, they became the subject of attacks, seeking to discredit them as being unscientific. So I just share that reflection from a little while back. Thank you, Bill. Um, I think we only really have time for one more question. Um, so maybe from the back, one of you. Um, sorry. Take two together. Yeah. Um, 
Um, so just to repeat for anyone who couldn't hear, it's about campaigns and engagement and what makes a good campaign. Well, I'm glad we should ask. We should ask. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, did you hear that, Milani? What, what, what do you think makes a good campaign? But you've done a lot of campaigning yourself and kind of a lot of going off on your own. <coughs> passion, maybe? <laughs> I think passion is definitely uh, a factor. Um, you also have to study your audience, you know exactly how to approach them. Um, so, knowing the culture, um, and just you know other important factors about the audience so that you could I guess so you can have a, a proper plan and your approach won't necessarily backfire and you get buy in and support from people that you need it from. Um so I do actually lecture on this so I'll be, I'll try and boil it down to thirty seconds. The dictionary definition of a campaign is a series of coordinated activities designed to achieve a single goal. And, uh, yes, I mean, it's a military word, which is interesting. Anyway, but a series, I, I love that definition because I can relate to every single word in it as to what makes a good campaign or not so good campaign. So a series of activities. It's got to be a series, not just one. You know, I've seen plenty of people that try and launch campaigns be before now. They put a lot of effort into the report that launches it or a big launch event, and only then do they think, oh, what next? And actually, you need to be lining up things all the time, ahead of time, to make sure there's a series of them. If you've got a big scientific study that's got you know some really rich stuff in it, actually creating four stories out of it rather than one is not a bad thing to do, line them up after each other, because then you build public pressure and so on. A series of activities. Activities, that's an important word. Actually do something. You know, actually, you'd be surprised the number of sort of people doing, I've seen doing campaigns before now, that actually don't do very much. Strangely enough, they don't win. So actually doing stuff is important. Designed, yeah, it takes a fair bit of designing, actually. That means identifying your target audiences, being clear where the power analysis is and the public pressure can happen and things like that. That's very important. There's a lot more in that. Uh, to achieve a single goal. And that's the, the important point there is a single goal or objective. Uh, actually being really clear what you want to achieve and being really laser-focused on it is very important. The moment you try and achieve too much from any one campaign, it will fall over and not really deliver. Uh, that's my short version. Yeah. Vladimir Putin might wish to reflect on some of that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so unfortunately, I, I know we could carry on discussing all these interesting things all evening, but um, I think that's all we have time for. So thanks again to uh, our amazing speakers and to the organisers. <laughs>
but very often we then lose contact to degree and it's kind of we don't really know what happened with the, the seeds we probably saw in, in terms of the intellectual yeah, engagement and, and the passion for conservation. So it's, it's massively encouraging to see what yeah, people get, get on to do after they graduated from our course and, and really the passion and the interest which really I think was present in all these talks. So thank you very, very much and yeah, enjoy the wine. <laughs> Thank you.